So we have now, by uh, my count, uh, reached uh, 65 uh, participants in, in attendance, uh, which I think uh, constitutes a full house, whether we're online or North Great Georgia Street. Um, so I think we can uh, proceed. Um, welcome, welcome to this uh, brave new world of Zoom diplomacy and, uh, and webinars. Um, I'm very happy today to welcome a distinguished panel of, of speakers. Uh, three ambassadors of Ireland to three very different uh, parts of the world to discuss how COVID-19 is playing out in their respective regions, the implications of COVID-19 and the responses both in um, their host states and the wider regions that they um, represent. I'd like to introduce our three uh, speakers. Uh, first of all, we have uh, Fanula Quinlan, Ambassador of Ireland to Kenya, joining us from Nairobi today. Secondly, we have Julian Clare, Ambassador of Ireland to the Republic of Korea, joining us from Seoul. And finally, Barbara Jones, Ambassador of Ireland to Mexico, joining us at 7 a.m. local time from Mexico City. Welcome all and looking forward to our um, discussions today. We're going to kick it off with um, some introductory remarks from our three panelists, um, talking, giving us a little bit of an overview um, of the situation regarding COVID-19 um, in their host uh, states and also the wider regions. Um, I'd like to go to uh, Fanula, first of all, for the view from Nairobi. Fanula. Good idea to unmute first. Um, thanks so much, Mary. And let me start by saying thank you so much to the IIEA for hosting us today and giving us an opportunity to reflect on the impacts of COVID in our various um, regions. Um, I thought I might start by drawing out some common themes, um, although you'll appreciate with a continent of 54 very different countries, um, you may have to indulge me somewhat. But just I'll make just a few points, I suppose, to frame the discussion. Um, the first thing I would say is that Africa is, is behind the curve when it comes to the number of cases that we're seeing. So while Africa has 17% of the world's population, we currently have 2% of the cases. Um, also, um, COVID arrived here substantially later. The first case was on February 14th in Egypt, and Lesotho became the last African state last week to declare its first COVID case. Um, health systems, as a rule, are much weaker here. Even South Africa, which you know, we would think has the strongest and does indeed have the strongest uh, public health system in Africa, has only a thousand ICU beds for a population of 56 million people, while Harare, the capital of Zimbabwe, has none. Um, governments here also, I mean, everywhere in the world, governments are making extraordinarily difficult decisions between public health and the economies. Here, that's even more difficult because we live you know, on this continent, eight out of 10 workers approximately work in the informal sector. So they're really very reliant on their daily wage or their weekly wage to sustain their families. There's really no room, no room for shocks, very little room for resilience there. Um, and of course, you know, with job losses, shrinking resources and so forth, those vulnerable people are even more vulnerable now as a result of COVID. But first, let me, let me talk a little bit about those low trans transmission rates that I mentioned in, at the outset. The WHO released some research last week that showed the virus is spreading much more slowly in Africa. They predict about a quarter of a billion people will, will contract the disease over the coming year, but that far fewer of them will die. Um, they note that Africans travel less and um, that they're younger. The average age in the continent is barely 20 and also that they're less likely to be obese and suffer from lifestyle-related diseases that plague some of the, the wealthier countries. But in terms of those low, low case rates, I guess if you look at Kenya, initially modeling would have predicted that we'd be at about 30,000 cases by now, whereas in fact we haven't yet reached 1,000, um, and that's out of about 40,000 people tested. So low testing certainly seems to be playing a, rate, playing a role. rather. Um, in Africa as a whole, it's estimated there's been about a million people tested, Compare that to Wuhan, where authorities plan on testing 11 million citizens in two weeks. But the WHO does think also that there's more to it than low testing rates, and they feel that there are cultural, developmental, and other um, structural elements that are playing a role in the lower transmission rates. And it's very likely, actually, that the, the, the very swift action by many African governments, the, the very swift way in which they introduce containment measures, have really helped to halt the spread. 
in Rwanda, for example, we saw that um, you know, within days of having their first case, they'd shut down, airports closed and so forth. Um, Ethiopia, Uganda were very quick with contact tracing and isolation. Um, South Africa sent 30,000 health workers out to communities to survey 15% of their population in, in a really short space of time. It's also worth bearing in mind, I suppose, that a lot of African countries have experience of infectious diseases, and particularly if we think of Ebola, and um, very, you know, very contagious diseases also. So in Liberia, a country that's desperately poor, and we might have expected to see, you know, really devastated by this, they very quickly rolled out their existing protocols and, and guidelines for, for Ebola to respond to COVID, and the same in countries bordering the DRC. Compare that to France and the US, which now only four months on, they're starting to introduce contact tracing. Um, and while it's true that many, many African governments acted very quickly, there's a few notable exceptions. So Madagascar's president, for example, has been peddling herbal tea as a cure. And um, Tanzania's president was very interested in that cure. And he's also recently claimed that papaya samples have tested positive for coronavirus. Just this weekend, he went to church and told told the, the population that, you know, COVID was now, um, COVID numbers were coming down significantly. They're going to allow tourists back into the country. Um, and in fact, the country hasn't released any data in three, in three weeks, but there's anecdotal evidence of a huge increase in deaths. And last weekend, Kenya closed their border with Tanzania out of concern for just this, um, this danger. Talking about containment, of course, on the flips, on the good side, it has helped contain the virus. On the negative side, it has led to a lot of human rights abuses. So um, in a, police and security officers in, in enforcing these lockdowns in Nigeria, Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, and elsewhere are accused of really of killing and beating people um, to, to enforce these restrictions. And of course, in Africa, as we've seen elsewhere, gender-based violence and um, domestic violence are increasing. I mentioned at the outset that health systems and of course the environment here also have a role to play. So what was very interesting, I was talking to the head of the WHO here last week and he told me that 75% of people testing positive are asymptomatic. They don't, they don't know at all that they're sick. Um, now there's no data to suggest why this is the case, but scientists are kind of positing that it may be because again, African people tend to have higher experience and exposure to infectious diseases and therefore they're better able to withstand the disease. Um, at the same time, Africa suffers from a much higher burden of TB, malaria, and, and other diseases. And there's a danger now that people won't go to hospitals for treatment. They won't go for routine immunizations and so forth because they're afraid of COVID. Um, and of course, you know, we, we, the, the public health officials are worried about a return of polio and various other things because people aren't going to get treatment. Um, living conditions here also are very different and pose significant challenges. Hundreds of millions of families live in slums or informal settlements. Um, Nairobi, where I am talking to you from today, is a city of 5 million people, almost 60% of whom live in these slums. And there you might find anything, you know, between 5 to 10 people sharing a room, um, no running water, families will spend a huge amount of their income on water, um, shared latrines and so forth. So very poor sanitation, you know, really living cheek by jowl, almost impossible to, to social distance. Um, a few, just two final points I'll make. One is on um, food security. Even before COVID broke out, more than a quarter of a billion people in sub-Saharan Africa were food insecure. And that's as a result of economic shocks, climate, conflict, and so forth. Obviously, COVID is now really exacerbating that, not least as a result of border closures and lockdowns, which are halting the supplies of seeds and fertilizers to farmers. Bear in mind, 60% of Africa depends on farming for their income and also food imports. At the same time, you know, we're seeing currency depreciation, falling prices for cash crops, falling revenues from stalled industries like oil and tourism. And so in response, many governments are introducing social safety protection programs. So cash transfers to vulnerable populations to allow them to buy food, at least the basics. Um, and last week, the governor of the Kenyan Central Bank said this is the biggest challenge facing certainly the Kenya, the country I'm in, in more than a century. Across, across the continent, trade is down by about a third. Um, so facilitating, trying to facilitate safe trade is obviously really, really important. Um, and, but the picture is grim, but there's also some positives that we may see in terms of 
the ability for manufacturers to adapt as they're doing in Kenya. We've seen a big increase in you know, the production of masks and PPE and sanitizers and so forth. Um, and also the gov governments are being encouraged now to go digital in terms of trade, um, which longer term could boost competitiveness. My last word is, is kind of a worrying one as well. It's in terms of security and anti-terrorism. Violent attacks in this region have gone up by a third in the month to mid-April. So ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Al-Shabaab have all said that they see this crisis as an opportunity to increase their terror, to, you know, to, to, to really um, roll out their terror agenda. Of course, at the same time, African governments like elsewhere in the world are, are you know, refocusing their military to pandemic response. And therefore, there may be there's risks that you know, terror organizations will take advantage of that. And of course, we also know peacekeepers and others are being rotated, rotated out um, because of COVID. So there is a real risk that the gains we've made could be rolled back across all of those um, different indicators. But maybe I'll stop there and happy to take questions later. Thank you very much, uh, Fanula. So uh, the picture you paint is, you know, at the beginning when COVID-19 hit Europe in particular, there was a lot of concern about what may happen when we started seeing cases um, in, in Africa as a continent. So you've painted a picture that has positives, but also negatives, particularly in the long term, the economic um, impact and the security impact. Julian, if we could turn to you. Um, you know, you're, you're in, in Seoul. Uh, South Korea was held up as an example of how to handle COVID-19 fairly well, sure, sure. Uh, given yeah. all the unpredictability of, of this. Yeah. That has had a bit of a reality check just recently because we see the emergence of the new clusters, etc. What is, uh, what is your uh, view on how uh, South Korea has, has handled this and, and how this may play out in the future? Oh, well, very obviously, thank you. Um, I, I would say um, very well. It's not just embassy bias. Um, there was the outbreak recently in the nightclubs, but they jumped on it very, very fast. Um, I mean, Korea has won a lot of praise. 66 countries and 23 international organizations have sought Korea's advice. Uh, the Taoiseach had a very good meeting, President Moon, a telephone meeting on the 4th of May. And Korea's approach, basically, it merges transparency in dealing with the public, uh, constant information, text messaging. Um, some people argue almost too much information. We can come back to that issue a little bit about privacy and so on, but an innovation of technology. And so it rests on three pillars, mass testing, contact tracing, and quarantine treatment. Korea has conducted more than 750,000 tests since January, and it does about 5,000 a day. When things were very bad in February, it was doing 10 to 15,000 a day. And what it also does is it puts up makeshift centers when you have an outbreak. So rather than bringing people into hospitals, um, what you see around the town, and it's been fascinating to see this, somebody living here, independently of, you know, embassy goals, just to, to be living here, these kind of improvised test centers, uh, drive-in test centers, liter literally like, uh, like, a, like, like a McDonald's, like, um, but where you, you, you get tested in 10 minutes, the results are available within hours, the, 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 the tester is separated physically from the person being tested. Um, and it's, it's extraordinary, you know, and, and it, it, it also keeps, um, it, you know, it, it prevents hospitals from having to be disinfected. Um, it, it, so it, it both protects basically health workers and, and, and the people being, being tested. That's the big testing thing here. Um, but the other side of it, of course, is this contact, contact tracing, which, of course, is an issue that we're all interested in. And basically, in Korea, text messages are sent to the public um, with anonymous information on, on, on cases. And so, actually, in fact, just before, uh, in fact, hopefully it won't happen when we're speaking now, your phone goes off quite often, and it will tell you of a case in your locality. And you can then check the, the, the path the person who has tested positive has taken. In other words, their kind of, if you like, their odyssey through shops, bars, restaurants, convenience stores, nightclubs, and so on. And if you were there at that time, then of course you come forward and you get tested. And if you are tested positive, and then of course your movements are traced and so on. Now, there are, some people have raised concerns in terms of privacy, but, um, in, in fairness, you know, there, there are snapback provisions, and I think there's a very strong public sense that in Korea that these are, uh, these are temporary measures, you know, uh, dealing with a public health emergency. The third pillar is treatment, where confirmed cases are 
are um, essentially, if it's a serious case, of course, to hospital, but if it's not such a serious case uh, in, in temporary facilities. Now, of course, it's a, by and large, as you mentioned the reality check, Mary, but it has overall been a very successful story. Um, but it didn't seem so three months ago. And at that stage, cases were rocketing. And after the, the, the kind of the, the what's now famous or infamous patient number 31, um, there were 2,300 cases in 10 days. New cases were appearing at a rate of 800 or 900 new cases per day. But through mass testing, contact tracing, quarantine treatment and social distancing, Korea it brought it down, it brought down in a really very short amount of time the number of new cases by 90%, the number of new cases each day by 90%. Basically, Korea went from having the second highest incidence at that time of COVID-19 in the world to the 43rd, where it is now. Um, so basically, it took about two weeks in early March, combining those things, the mass testing, the, the, the contact tracing, the quarantine treatment, social distancing. It took about two weeks in early March to go from 800 new cases a day to fewer than 100. Merely four weeks later, on the 15th of April, um, Korea held parliamentary elections, um, um, which were, you know, they had protocols like social distancing, uh, taking um, um, temperatures, um, hand sanitizers, disposable gloves. But in those elections, um, and people thought maybe they'd have to be postponed, but in those elections, 29 million people voted. Um, the highest turnout uh, since 1992. So basically, yes, what Korea did was it provided a kind of a, 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 a template for flattening the curve. Um, or as Bill Gates referred to in an interview last night as, as bending the curve, as he announced um, funding for, for two Korean organizations for um, big data tracking of COVID-19 and for work on a, a, um, a, 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 a medical treatment. And in fact, one of the, one of the companies one of the beneficiary companies, SK Bioscience, is a kind of a cousin company of SK Biotech, who's a, you know, a major um, foreign direct investment source in Korea, in Ireland. Just to say briefly, uh, and I, 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 just on the Korean example, because I, I know, as you say, Mary, it, it is one that has provoked um, great interest. Um, one of the reasons um, uh, for its success um, has been the lessons learned from the bruising experience of MERS in 2015. At the time, the um, in fact, the current president, President Moon, as the leader of the opposition, was, uh, as many others were, deeply critical of the approach at the time in terms of lack of transparency, lack of kits and so on. And the response was really, in Korea, an accelerated program to develop kits, use CCTV, CCTV footage, geolocation data and so on. So when COVID-19 um, struck, uh, Korea was ready to, to, to go with a network of 96 public and private laboratories to test for COVID-19. In fairness, well, in fairness to Korea, because I think it has won many admirers, but there is an important cultural point, uh, which I'm sure many uh, people today will, uh, in, in the audience will have seen, is that sometimes there has been a, a tendency to say, well, this is down to you know, Confucian culture and it's a very obedient society and so on. But a lot of commentators have said, this actually sells Korea short. And it's a very reductive analysis, because the reality is that, in fact, Korea is almost, I don't want to say like a hyper-democracy, in that um, it's got a very strong culture um, of, of, of protest, uh, whether it's you know, the political demonstrations or whether it's you know, one person with a megaphone outside his former you know, in, in office of employment, whatever. Um, because frankly, people in this country fought hard for um, their freedom in the 1980s. And in fact, two days ago marked the 40th anniversary of a, a terrible um, massacre of, of, of demonstrators in Gwangju in 1980, um, seeking freedom, which the country uh, secured in, in 1987 through its own uh, bravery. So in a way, this argument um, about, um, well, you know, uh, 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 the people in Korea followed the advice because it's an obedient society, it's actually really, really most unfair. And the, rea the reality is, is that the more persuasive reason for the success of the containment measures in this country is that basically the government acted convincingly and, and, the, and the public respect of the device. The last thing I just say, just in terms of, of Korea, is again just to put its social distancing achievements into perspective. Um, same type of measures, you know, standing apart, temperature checks, working from home, and so on. But um, in many ways, it's, it's more striking in this country because um, 
because of population density. Korea has a population density of 503 people per square kilometer. The EU 27 collectively have a population density of 117 people per square kilometer. And then you add to the fact that 70% of Korea is mountainous. And then beyond that, you add the fact that this is a very uh, a social uh, culture, a very social country where you know people, you know, it's very unusual to eat alone. People, you know, people, workers dine together at lunchtime and so on. So, so in many ways, social distancing has required um, has required an even greater um, effort here. So the last thing I'll say is that, of course, and, and then Fanula was talking about economic impacts here. Of course, you know, not so bad, but still, um, almost half a million jobs lost, biggest loss in twenty years. Exports so far in May halved compared to last year. But there are encouraging signs in the sense of Korea has provided um, a very effective template in terms of early action to deal with COVID-19, both in terms of harnessing technology, but also winning public trust. Not every lesson is, is repl rep replicable everywhere. Uh, I think they accept that. But, but I think Korea is keen in a multilateral framework to, 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 to share its lessons, which is, 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 is deeply encouraging. And um, I think there's a lot we can all um, a lot we can all take from this. It has been a great, frankly, I'm not saying this, you know, as an embassy bias. It has been a great a, a privilege, a great fortune to 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 be living here in this time. And then just to say, look, it's it's difficult to sum up the whole region. You know, I know obviously it's very variable throughout the region, but perhaps we can certainly come to that more in the in the in, Q and A. The and thanks, thank, thank you, Mary. Thanks very much, Richard. Excellent. Thank you for that uh, overview, Julian. And uh, to turn now to to Barbara um, in Mexico City. And Barbara, you are ambassador to to Mexico, of course, uh, your brief also means that you represent Ireland in other countries across the region, including Venezuela, Colombia, Peru, Cuba. Um, very different countries, very different contexts and perspectives, etc. cetera. Um, so the floor is, is yours to give us a flavor of what it, how this has played out, not just in Mexico, but more regionally. Yeah, super, Mary, and thank you very much, echoing the colleagues' comments about the benefit of this sort of pooling of ideas. I think listening to, to Fanula and Julian, you have a real sense of that we're here now, the epicenter where Julian was talking about earlier, earlier times in, in February and in March. So Americas, the Americas, Mexico's in North America, the Americas are now the epicenter of the COVID-19 pandemic in the world in this wave. If the, if the World Health Organization is right, this wave may just wash across the Pacific and roll again through, please God not. So what we're looking at here at the Americas is obviously the US as the lead, 1.5 million cases, 90,000 people have died uh, so uh, tragically in the United States. Uh, then in Latin, in the Latin part of America, we have the Brazil in the lead with 250,000 plus cases. And that's 50% of the cases in Latin America are in Brazil and 17,000 deaths approximately based on official figures. Um, then we're looking at in terms of the death count, which is, oh my goodness, who would have ever thought about thinking about this part of the world in that way? But Canada uh, it follows Brazil in the Americas with 6,000 deaths, followed by Mexico and Peru uh, with a fairly, uh, relatively speaking, a modest amount. So what you have here in the Americas is all of the interconnections that flow from migration, remittances, the intra and interdependencies of the region being highlighted and brought to really to the surface here. For example, one of the socioeconomic impacts of, of COVID-19 in Central America and in Mexico is the disproportionate impact of this, of the COVID-19 in the United States on the Hispanic and uh, the African-American community, remittances on the floor, wiping out the essential lifeline for poor, as, as Fanula says, a great dependency on the informal economy in all of these countries, and a dependency, as in Ireland, for, for decades and decades, for generations, on the money coming from America. So what we're looking at here, I mean, at the top line, obviously, a, a great variation. And I was talking to, to Paul Gleeson, Alison Milton is now our ambassador to Colombia, we've an embassy there. 
Jackie and uh, Barry Tomaty and Sean Hoy just in prepping for this. We have, we're a small group, uh, five countries, uh, six offices. And what's a common theme on this is the public health crisis, unmasking a social crisis that was there already of inequality and poverty. For example, in Mexico, I would just highlight one figure, a brilliant group, Cuneval, bringing out a study last, last Monday saying that as a result of COVID-19, 10 million, one zero million more people will join the lines of extreme poverty in Mexico. So the, the, the devastating on the social side, on the, let's, let's broadly say on the, the political side, um, you're looking at several right throughout the region, a, a, a swathe of elections have been postponed. We have three important elections coming up. We have the plebiscite coming up in Chile. We have uh, an important, um, uh, how would you say it, an important test coming up in Dominican Republic and in uh, Bolivia too. So here you see the, the, this trend of emergency powers all over the world. I mean, Eamon Gilmore, our special rep, EU special rep, briefed some of the colleagues recently, and he described it as the largest setback for human rights in the world because of emergency measures. And all of our governments are having to do this, as Julian says, for the necessity for the public health uh, crisis. What I would highlight here is the question of the capacity of the state itself the states themselves to deal with a pandemic of this scale and of this virulence. So we're in the very first phase of it now, and it really is, it really is too early to, to say, Mary, where the region will end up. We have strong constitutional democracies in the region, which you see here what Fanula said. We see we have, for example, in a great friend of Ireland government of Nicaragua, the people of Nicaragua, but a certain denial in the public narrative about the case, 25 reported cases. We also saw very, very tardy responses in some of the more populous countries in the Americas, a certain denial of the science. And I mean, maybe there's something about the way populist governments have responded to this that we can touch on. But here it is a bit like, you know, the final lives of Juno and the Peacock. You know, the whole world may be in a terrible state of chassis. Nothing like a, a bit of Juno to, to finish off. Thank you, Barbara. Um, you know, what's clear uh, from the three overviews is the sense of uncertainty here and the unpredictability of the situation we all find ourselves in now. Minus a vaccine, fears of a second or possibly third wave, we're really you know, approaching this on a day-to-day -day basis in, in so many respects. But just um, a couple of questions before we um, go to Q&A with the audience later, and I would encourage our attendees to send questions through the Q&A function um, uh, over the next 10 minutes or so before we go into Q&A proper and during the Q&A session. But before we, we go to Q&A, um, I'd like to ask our three panelists a question in terms of how the European Union um, has been perceived uh, throughout this um, uh, crisis? Has it been perceived as an effective actor um, in terms of its engagement with your respective regions throughout this period? Also how you, the EU has, has dealt with this situation itself? Um, and also how multilateral organizations um, are perceived in, in your respective regions as well. Um, the World Health Organization, we've seen there have been criticisms, there's been praise, different uh, views of how it has handled um, this uh, particular episode. Fanula, we'll, we'll start with you. Thanks, Mary. Um, well, maybe I'll start with the EU response. Um, I mean, overall, the EU put together a package of 20 billion to help the most vulnerable countries to respond, and many of those countries were in Africa. Um, certainly in Kenya, they would, they're perceived to have done a really excellent job. Um, so they've pulled together a package of 300 million here, um, composed of grants and loans to, to SMEs to keep them buoyant, working very closely with the European Investment Bank. Uh, 
but also providing some direct support to, to government, investing in those cash transfers I spoke about earlier so that vulnerable families can have a minimum income to buy the basic necessities. They're investing in uh, community health as well and safe trade. So I spoke earlier about, you know, the dangers and, you know, the, 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 the many impacts that blocked trade has. So the EU is funding an organization called Trademark East Africa that works very closely with governments in this region to try to make trade safer so we can keep the trade corridors open but ensure that officials have PPE, that they're moving digital and so on and so forth. Um, so they've they, they've really they've really I think been regarded been regarded as responding well. In fact, I know President Kenyatta of, of Kenya actually rang the EU head of delegation to you know thank the EU for their support. Um, of course, the AU is the big multilateral organization in this um, part of the world, and they also mobilized quickly. They've established a COVID task force. They've developed a continental strategy for responding to COVID. Um, the chair, who's the South African president, Sir, Cyril Ramaphosa, has actually appointed four envoys to go out and really advocate for debt relief and for the international community to stand by Africa at this moment. Um, and that advocacy has, has had some impact. I mean, we've seen the G20 suspend uh, debt repayments for some time. The IMF also offer debt relief. And most of the beneficiaries of those were countries in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, the, um, the Africa CDC uh, has, done, has done very well. They're trying to pool the resources of African countries so that they're better able to benefit in terms of you know, procurement practices and, and uh, training and so forth of health workers. So they've also played a very important part. Um, so I think overall the multilateral response here would be regarded as, as, you know, as having worked. I mean, obviously this, there's an awful lot to do. There's an awful lot of, there's a huge amount of need um, and certainly I think that, you know, people will continue to look to the international community um, for further measures to support Africa when, when indeed the peak does hit. Thank you for that, Fanula. Over to you, Gillian. Mary, thanks. Yeah, no, I think um, it has uh, boosted the image of the EU here, um, including the activity behind the 20 billion euro package Fanula mentioned. Um, just the EU in some ways here, well, I'll say underappreciated, but it, um, the EU, for instance, just in the case of Korea, is it's, it's fourth, you know, fourth largest uh, export, um, in, in, you know, uh, uh, treating as a country uh, destination. Uh, and it's the largest single source of foreign direct investment in Korea. But like in a lot of countries, um, sometimes there isn't really a sense of maybe um, the partnership perhaps so often isn't as rich maybe as the economic interaction would 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 would, would merit. I think that's not that's not a that's not an issue unique to this country by any means. Um, but I think there's a lot of work good work going on uh, to to raise the profile of the EU here. And I think the the corona diplomacy that Korea has engaged on uh, has brought it into closer contact with the EU, both with the institutions of the EU and at the United Nations. And lastly, I'd say just to link back to the, the aid dimensions that Fanula mentioned, um, and even looking as recently as the comments made by President Moon at the World Health Assembly yesterday and so on, Korea is looking much more to aid, and I think that will bring it again more closely into the EU's orbit. It has the unique experience of going, of course, from, from being a, an aid recipient to an aid donor in its you know, extraordinary historical trajectory of development. Uh, in this country, and I think that is something that that's something that will will um, bind it more closely to the EU, and I think will 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 um, I think the, the the contacts that have been made and discussions that have been occasioned by coronavirus, the COVID nineteen, I, I think will will um, I think will will bring will bring the EU and and Korea together in a whole raft of dimensions. Thank you. Thank you, Julian and uh, Barbara. Over to you finally. Um, on the European Union visibility here, I think it has been a moment, a really defining moment for our new leadership in, in Brussels. I think that the leadership of uh, Ursula uh, herself has been so, so impressive. The crystallizing moment here in Latin America where there's a 
a very significant and correct debate led brilliantly by Mexico and the United Nations for public access to the vaccine and a, an easing of intellectual IP gains in the, shall we say, around access to medicines has created a visibility for the European Union with the pledging conference, Mary, phenomenal to see that. And, um, and I think in a, in a really complementary way, working with the United Nations and that solidarity, Ireland quadrupling our support for the World, World Health Organization. So a certain position of visibility for the union, but I, I, I speak from a conviction here that we're stronger when we're aligning our European Unionness and values with the mandated authority of the United Nations agencies. And I think that was a brilliant moment. Here in the field, all of my colleagues, Sean, Paul, Alison, Jackie, Barry, report alacrity in the response, reprogramming of money. And there is not, it's not, you know, Latin America is not a, a, a recipient of the EU as the world's lead, leading donor in the way many people might imagine but a great alacrity of response, great leadership from the center. Maybe just give a shout out, given that it's the IIEA, to fabulous support for Ireland with the repatriation of our citizens from here, um, from the European Union, the emergency mechanism, my colleagues in Brussels, Noel, the team working with Anne Derwin and colleagues in Dublin. Fabulous visibility in our own country for what European Union solidarity is. And my final point, Mary, really is a very important one, and it's something that I would like to highlight. Fanula mentioned early on the question of thematic, you know, when you look at the world, is the world, you know, is this a leveler? Mary Robinson said last week, COVID is not a leveler. Actually, it highlights all the, dis the discrimination and the inequalities. And one of the greatest source of inequalities in the world is the issue of women's rights. And here in this crisis, we are seeing women's rights once again being the highlight, you know, the highlighted vulnerable group. Let me just give you an example. The issue of gender based violence and the peak in violence against women in countries with this machismo and this inbuilt cultural and it's worldwide i mean i'm not i'm not singling any country out for it it's a trend but i would like to highlight the great work being done by the united nations women's organization we have a brilliant leader here belen sands let a whole team of people in new york working with geraldine byrne and there's something about the necessity for ireland in my opinion to align our great feminism and our great support for equality around that issue now because it it is a crisis that women, it, there is a risk that in some countries more women will die of violence from the restrictive measures of being holed up at home in small, inadequate uh, accommodation and themselves uh, be victim of murder and femicide, which is a, a terrible plague in the world. And as I say, I highlight it because it's a Latin problem, but as Fanula said, it's not just a problem of Latin America or of, of Ireland or of Europe. The HCHR as well, I would give a shout out for, for great leadership. Um, uh, Madame Bachelet highlighting the injustice in this context of the continued blockade of Cuba. I mean, here's a country having a fantastically uh, well-managed response to the crisis, sending out their brigadas medicas around the world, and they themselves cannot access on the open market the medicines that they need. And here's the European Union, you know, organizing PPE, Swiss government sending in ventilators, European Union medicines. So really great visibility, great solidarity, but with the United Nations, Mary, I think that's the piece. You know, it's not a competition for visibility. It's a competition for effectiveness to save lives. Thank you, Barbara. And before we move to uh, Q&A with our uh, attendees, I would ask all three of you to just give us um, a, a brief overview um, of Ireland's engagement uh, with your respective uh, regions. Uh, what are we talking about? Uh, development, trade, diplomacy, human rights. And of course, as all three of you have touched on, I mean, what we're dealing right now in terms of this crisis is, is unprecedented. And 
um, you know, the, the, the way paradigms will change, whether it's related to development, whether it's related to trade, whether it's related to bilateral relations between countries, so much is, again, going back to that word uncertainty, so much is uncertain, unpredictable right now. But if you could, before we move to the, the attendees, give us an overview of Ireland's engagement with your respective regions. Thank you. Would you like me to start, Mary? Are we, we're staying in the same order. Um, so um, I'm accredited to Nairobi, covering Sudan, Somalia and Eritrea. Um, the embassy here actually was closed in the 80s as a result of um, cutbacks fiscal situation in Ireland. But in 2014, I guess there was a, you know, the government is in the process of um, increasing, of course, our global footprint. And Kenya was seen as an obvious place where we should be represented given, you know, it's a big economic, it's a big geopolitical player. Of course, it's the economic powerhouse of East Africa. And we have very deep and long roots here. I mean, we just need to think of, and I, it's a great pleasure of mine to meet so many of the missionaries that have been here for many years and really have done fantastic work in terms of building Ireland's reputation in terms in healthcare and in um, education particularly. We've also had many NGOs concern and many others, Trocra have been operational here. So we reopened in 2014 uh, with a dual mandate really, um, certainly to build trade. Kenya is becoming a middle income, a lower middle income country. You know, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of potential in terms of services agribusiness, um, technology, and so forth. We had our first trade mission, uh, our first ever trade mission last November, led by Minister Heather Humphreys, 40 plus businesses coming here and a lot of deals done. At the same time, of course, I mentioned some of the countries I'm covering, Sudan and Somalia, Eritrea, they're among some of the most um, fragile countries in the world. Uh, Somalia, particularly, obviously, deeply afflicted, afflicted by conflict over many years. So we're also engaged in the development sphere with a relatively modest budget. Um, so here in Kenya, we're working in agriculture, supporting um, supporting agriculture. You know, it's it's uh, about it accounts for about two thirds of GDP and more than much more than two thirds of employment. So making a difference there can really be transformational. Um, and we're working um, on in dairy and in um, in potatoes and so forth leveraging the experience of Chagask really um, to help help support that sector. Education, we have Young Scientists Kenya, um, which is a wonderful initiative, really reaching many, many thousands of students here and, and helping to build the industries and the skills of the future. And then we're also supporting the development of the private sector. So that's supporting the equivalence of the IDA um, in Ireland to, so that Kenya, Kenya can develop their FDI. But, um, and then there's a lot of humanitarian funding, of course, going to Sudan and Somalia, as I mentioned already, um, more than 3 million this year. Um, consular is another big issue, and actually that came to the fore um, during this crisis. We have a population here, an Irish population, something in the region of about between 1,000 and 1,500. Um, some, many of them stayed, many of them have been here for many years, but others did need to be repatriated and the flights closed down here pretty quickly. So we assisted citizens to leave Kenya, Sudan and Somalia. No, um, we have um, a very vibrant... I'm just conscious of... Sorry, Mary. I'm conscious of the time, time. ahead of us. So if you could... Uh, i leave it there. Okay, thank you. Uh, Julian, over to you. Um, well, very clearly, Asia Pacific is going to be critical to our economic recovery. Um, the post COVID, the um, Department for Foreign Affairs and Trade launched an Asia strategy uh, at the beginning of this year um, because Asia is so important. Asia Pacific is home to four billion people. It's it's home to six of the large six of the largest twenty global economies: China, Japan, India, Korea, Australia, Indonesia. Uh, and it's the primary driver of, of the global economy. Uh, it contributes 60% of economic uh, global growth. So it's going to have 3.5 billion middle class people by 2030. So um, we are already deeply invested um, in Asia economically. Um, we're looking to, to expand our, our footprint uh, to, to uh, last year. We opened a very important um, a consulate general in Mumbai, um, planning to open in, in the Philippines, and the other consulate, consulate general in China. So we have an established, often young business population throughout Asia. As, as Lula said, we also have missionaries, including here in Korea, where we've had outstanding Colum Columban missionaries who've given decades of service um, to this country. So Asia Pacific is going to be absolutely 
with critical and will remain or will become even more critical to our, to our, our, our economic agenda. Just if I may very briefly mention, um, and I've, 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 I've been remiss talking, not really talking enough about the, the region, um, really focusing on the Korea COVID-19 experience, but it would be remiss not to mention just the outstanding work that colleagues have done in this region in responding to, to COVID-19, you know, with China in terms of uh, uh, sourcing PPE um, in, 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 in repatriation flights, Japan dealing with the Diamond Princess state of emergency, our embassy in Singapore dealing with not just issues in Singapore, but in very, very difficult cases in the Philippines. Australia has got a huge Irish population. Australia and New Zealand have done phenomenal work in helping Irish people getting home in Indonesia. Indonesia and India, of course, um, um, you know, again, repatriation flights of, of Irish people confronted with the, um, including with, with the lockdown situation and there. So really, you know, it, 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 um, the, the, the work that has been done, and I'm sure this is the same, this is the same the whole world over, but the work that's been done by our colleague embassies here in Asia Pacific in close coordination with our colleagues and consular at home and, and um, throughout the department has, has been extraordinary. And, and in talking about the region, uh, given the uh, sort of the primary interest, I suppose, in, in the, the Korea coronavirus approach, uh, I just wanted to rebalance it a bit and, 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 and to mention that it's, it's, we've, we've had it lucky, I suppose, in the sense of, you know, the country that we've been in. And really, we've, we've looked on and, and, and seen some incredible work done by our colleagues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julian. And Barbara, over to you. Okay, so this, the soundbite on Ireland's relations with 33 countries is, I think it's, it is true to say, relations with this region between Ireland on the bilateral side are excellent. Historically, there's a deep, you know, there's an invisible Irish footprint through, you know, Tim Fanning's fabulous book about the, un, the forgotten Irish of Latin America, built the, participate in the colonization, changed sides, built democracy here. Many of the constitutions bear the imprint of Irish enlightenment thinkers who were emigres from our own country. So a fabulous values piece in the culture. Um, that translates in modern day times to this great, great shared view between Ireland and all of these countries about the expectation that the world will be a fairer place and that the guarantors for that are the multilateral system. And for example, here, the great candidacy of Ireland for the Security Council campaign, people look to us to be that voice, that independent Ireland and also that Ireland of solidarity, but leveraging our membership and our commitment to the European Union to, to bring the, the, the needs, shall we say, uh, of the partnership to the table. Maria, I would like to highlight, if I could, the fabulous work here. The, you know, this is not a development partner relationship for Ireland, but there is fantastic work underway here through the funding we give to multilateral institutions, all that money, 85 million we've given to the UN system for the crisis, working its way through here. Brilliant leadership, for example, by Alison Milton in the surf, uh, flexible money for emergencies. This is a very uh, earthquake and disaster prone region. And then the great, great work of Trocra in Guatemala, Honduras and Nicaragua in the hardest of circumstances right now on the front line working in communities make you very proud of the practical expression of our values and the great support that the Irish Aid Programme gives. So excellent relations, great belief in the multilateral order, well done to, by the way, the international financial institutions, the IMF, for giving the free loans. Paul Deason was saying to me the money is flowing through. So very important test for the multilateral system. If we fail this test, bad outcome. We're winning this test and that's the good outcome. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you.